there are so many questions I want to ask you, and, and I'm going to try to boil this down to sort of three or four more questions to ask, because I could literally spend an entire day with you, uh, because I, I think this is very valuable. But let me ask you the question of, um, you, you had a reputation for being um, a zealous advocate, for, in, in the eyes of some, a zealous advocate of air power. For others, you were joint, but expressing, fighting your services side of, of, of the equation where you thought it could contribute to military operations. What, what do you see as the challenge and the problem potentially for jointness? And, and why is it that if the Air Force fights its corner, it becomes something that ends up divisive, whereas the other services fight their corners, but it is not seen that way? Why, why do you think it's sort of seen as the Air Force, when it argues its corner, somehow that's not seen as, as joint? Well, because the other services have a dog in that fight. They all have their own Air Force. And so when the U.S. Air Force, when America's Air Force uh, takes the lead or, or uh, gets into an advocacy role, it constitutes a threat to the Marines. They've got a perfectly wonderful tactical Air Force. To the Navy, probably the second best tactical Air Force in the world belongs to the U.S. Navy. Uh, even the Coast Guard's got an Air Force. The Army's got the biggest Air Force in the world if you count uh, just you know, vehicle by vehicle because they've got so many choppers. And I understand the CIA now is inventing its own Air Force. So everybody in this town has got their own Air Force. And they don't look to the U.S. Air Force, all of them, for leadership. And they, they resent Air Force taking the lead role uh, because it constitutes a sort of a bureaucratic threat to their budgets and to their uh, head strength and, and so forth. Uh, I never shrank from that fight. Uh, most chiefs are smarter than me. They, you know, they try to keep out of public fights, but uh, I've had a high profile of advocacy for the U.S. Air Force and uh, uh, part of it was that we had uh, thrust on us by Congress, by Sam Nunn and others, a, roles, a study on roles and missions, a commission on roles and missions. Quorum was appointed. And we had to all of us go up there and testify about roles and missions, and I was quite frank about it. You know, I said, look, you got, I mean, Sam Nunn had talked about the four Air Force problem for a long time. And I said, the only problem with Sam is his number's too small. Everybody's got an Air Force. You know, the FBI's got an Air Force, for crying out loud. Border Patrol. So everybody thinks they're an expert in the Air Force business, and, and they resent it when, in some ways, they, it constitutes a threat to their organization for us to get too able in our advocacy. Uh, that's, a, that's a problem for every Air Chief to work in his own way. Some are more successful than others. Uh, but it's, it's a continuing problem. Do you, um, let me take you to the reorganization of the Air Force. That was, at the time, a massive challenge. What do you think um, you got right? And what do you think can be improved upon now that you look back on it 25 years after this seminal reorganization into Air Combat Command, AMC, and all the other subordinate parts? Well, I got a lot right. Uh, I made some big mistakes also. Uh, but only a couple. I mean, basically, uh, the idea was to simplify our organization and streamline it. And so wherever found, if there was a redundant operation, I closed it up. Or if somebody was just sort of dangling out there on one of our bases and didn't report to anybody close to him, I closed it down. Or I put him under the local wing commander. And as a consequence, we had 13 major air commands when I started and, and eight when I finished. So we got rid of five major air commands, which meant five commanders and five secretaries and five staff cars and five offices and five sets of furniture and so on. Part of that was to eliminate the spending on these uh, superfluous uh, activities. But Savings was not my real objective. My real objective was to, was to strengthen the, the chain of command, 
to make our wiring diagram more solid, more dependable, more reliable by simplifying it. Now, um, that putting, putting flight line maintenance in our flying squadrons, for instance, is a good idea. And it produced a different kind of fighter squadron or any kind of flying squadron. I mean, the squadron commander's job beforehand would be to be in charge of 40 or 50 college graduate volunteers. Now, you put flight line maintenance in, and, and the size of the squadron goes up to a couple hundred, 250. A lot, it's enlisted heavy now, different kind of leadership problem, different preparation for that lieutenant colonel for what's to come in life. So that was good. Bringing back the group as a command level, that was good. Uh, previously, the group uh, was a sort of a staff officer, the deputy commander for operations, typically. Um, so th these kind of internal reforms were very good. I made a mistake in a, a couple of things. One is I put the ICBM force in Air Combat Command. That was n made no sense whatsoever. That we don't integrate conventional air operations with ICBM operations. They're just different, and so. That should have always been part of Space Command or, or something like that. But I moved a lot of people to Langley and put them on the staff at Langley and then turned around in a year when I figured out I'd made a mistake and moved them. Well, Bull, Bull Lowe was uh, over at Air Combat. He was the first Air Combat Command Chief and, and had the ICBMs uh, un, under him there for a while. He did. My fault. My mistake. Uh, and C-130s. And C-130s. And that wasn't a mistake. Taking them out was a mistake. I didn't put enough tankers in Air, air Combat Command. We cannot fight modern air operations in a theater without tankers. Can't do it. So why they should be separated from the command that, uh, in peacetime, from the way we're going to organize them in wartime is a mystery to me. But I let Secretary Rice talked me into putting the tankers, most of them, in Air Mobility Command. And uh, he and I have talked about this since then. He still thinks he was right, and I still think I shouldn't have given up on that. But the, the, the reorganization was so important, and I needed to do it quickly. I mean, Rice and I were agreed on all of these major reorganization moves before Desert Storm kicked off in January. I mean, I'd been chief for two and a half months when I walked out of Rice's office with the blueprint for a reorganized Air Force that he and I agreed on. And we implemented immediately. You know, if we waited till my third year, if we'd set up a study group and waited, you know, you don't, that's not that the way you get change. You have to. Here's the way you, you organize something. You start by organizing it. Then you reorganize it. Then you reorganize it. <laughs> then you reorganize it. Organization is a work like painting the you know, Golden Gate Bridge. You get to one end, you go back to the other end, start over again. Uh, so I, did, I wasn't worried about making mistakes. I knew I was going to make some mistakes. But I knew it was more important to get started on it and then fix it as we went along. So, you know, fear was never a factor there. I just, I was quite content to make mistakes. And that's the only way you get a big job like that done. 